Hello and welcome to the Mindset Michelle TV show. We're so super, super excited for you to be joining us yet again for an amazing episode with yet another incredible, incredible guest today. Today's guest is the amazing Kevin Bill. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. And it's so wonderful to have you come on the show today. For those of you that aren't aware of Kevin, well, where do I start? What a distinguished and incredible career Kevin has had and he's still having. It, it, he's got a long way to go still, I know. He's been working in the technology space. He's been vice chancellor of a university. So he's got that academia element. And, of course, the common thread throughout all of that is that innovation part, that part where that transitioning technology into corporate and corporate into research is something that he's very, very well versed with. And I think, you know, that mindset of being that adaptable and working across very different cultures of universities and, and corporate, but also working in technology that has actually been growing and changing so exponentially. But Kevin, I know people watching will all be thinking, how did you come to be working in technology and how did you come to be at a university and working for companies like Amazon. Please explain how you <laughs> came to be doing what you're doing. <laughs> sure. I, I, I wish it would. Uh, I wish I could sort of say it was a, a brilliant plan that I had mapped out from my earliest um, undergraduate days. Um, a, a, a lot of serendipity, but um, I, I'd worked in in education. I, I taught English as a foreign language in Japan, and I had no idea what I was doing. I had no pedagogy no theory behind it so sort of reverse engineered that a little bit when I'd finished that time in Japan my, my partner now my wife and I moved to um, the US and we settled actually in, uh, in in Vermont which wasn't the uh, thriving metropolis that we thought we might move to but my wife had found a master's program she liked and I stumbled across a small graduate school that had been built as sort of an appendage or, or, an, or an extra feature to a, a small liberal arts school in, in Marlborough, Vermont. Um, and the president, who was a, a super innovative young guy, um, I'll, I'll give you his name in a moment, um, had decided that there was some future in this, in this computing thing and, and some means of delivering technology, uh, delivering education that could work with technology and I ended up doing my master's there and it was one of the first or earliest kind of hybrid programs uh, where we met once every two weekends and then we did a lot online in between. Now, these were dial-up connections in Vermont, US, so it was pretty low tech, but something about it kind of pricked an interest that I'd had for some time about the potential of technology, particularly of getting people kind of in the same room when they weren't in the same room. I think the first, first synchronous session we had, we did on, I think it was Yahoo Instant Messenger on a dial-up. Um, and I made a stupid joke because that's what I do about, does anyone mind if I smoke? I, I don't smoke and I never have done. But the reaction was kind of, oh, uh, uh, some people were giving me permission to smoke, despite the fact that I was by myself in my own house. Some people were a bit freaked out that I was going to smoke because I'm on a call with people and somehow the smoke might go. And it was just this interesting <laughs> juxtaposition of literal physical presence and connected um, interaction that I, I really kind of fascinated me. And, and on reflection, it sort of took me back to, I, I guess, the, the first ever spark of that. My mom, um, who's, who's, uh, she came over to visit just recently, was one of the first women, I think she, she thought she was actually the second to be hired to do computer programming um, back in the, the early 70s in the UK, um, when companies and, and particularly banks and large companies started to do computing for, for payroll. Basically, that was the only function. And the computers were the sizes of houses. But she was one of the first people. She was identified um, through her early career as someone with a really great analytical mind. And she was pulled in to do some of this computing. Um, and to be honest, I think she could have had a, a, an absolutely stellar, financially rewarding career. She actually chose not to because she decided bless her, that she wanted to spend some time with my brother and I in school holidays. So she shifted to lecture in technology in a, in a local college, um, which gave her breaks and it gave her some time off with us in the holidays, etc. But as, as part of that, she brought home one of the earliest Apple computers. Um, and, and this has gone back pretty much to punch cards and then beyond. So it was right on that position where computers started shifting from almost completely unusable, um, you know, 
coders only to people who could actually do things. And, and my brother and I played a couple of games on this computer and it was just this presence in the house. So I had this presence of a technology thing in the house. My dad, who was also a teacher, um, very musical, very literate, um, lots of books in the house. So I think looking back, I hadn't realized at the time, but this again, to use that word, juxtaposition of, of technology in one corner and sort of academia and education. And in my dad's case, he, he taught in, in really poor areas, low socioeconomic areas of, of Newcastle in Northern England, which at the time was a, if you've ever watched Billy Elliot, you know, right, the coal mines kind of went away. There was a lot of strife, a lot of poverty. Um, and a lot of kids and families who had it really tough. My dad took it on himself to try and keep these kids engaged. He basically said if, if his comment was, if I fail, you know, they're going to fail. Um, and he used to say, well, yeah, I, I had success and some people went in one direction and others ended up in, in jail. So it was almost that level of, of importance. What he did, getting education right for him, did impact and changed a lot of lives. And then my mom, on the other hand, was was bringing this notion of technology in that I think kind of came together when I when I hit this master's degree and thought we could actually do stuff with this and we could meld academia, education, culture and technology and do something. Um, that was in 99, 2000, 99 slash the year 2000, right around that Y2K, which was fun. Um, so it's been 20 years and, and I haven't nailed it yet. I don't think I've solved the world's problems, but I've had real fun engaging in it and i think um it's been you know a really rewarding trip and, and as you say it's it's still going hopefully i've got a few more uh, rounds in me but um but yeah it's that's that's sort of how i got in that position of technology education culture um behavior i guess so i'm still there <laughs> wow what an amazing interesting story and um if there was more time i'd tell you the stories about my um, uncle working in greenwich and IBM okay. there where the first punch card um, yeah. computers were created. Yeah. But um, Kevin, I'm I'm hearing your story and I'm I'm loving that um that you know flow and that connection with your family, with the culture mm. and the importance from um you know Newcastle and, and you know education and, and the tool that it can be to transform people's lives. And I can hear the passion that was born out of that time and, and with your wife and that connection, you know, she chose the time with you guys rather than with the career focus, et cetera. Mm. But it still, again, was that underlying passion then for what you were doing. And um, my first um, Macintosh, we used to play the Lemonade game, which I'm sure you'll remember, mm -hmm. was one of the first ways of interacting with computers. Yeah. But enough yeah. about the computers, Kevin. I'm, I'm fascinated with this very distinguished and very extensive um, background then within the academic side and within the re recognising the corporate applications of it. What now in your life and in your world does success mean to you? Mm. I, I'm getting to that age where it's things like health and happiness, right, which I think, you know, we're all trying to hang on to. And, and particularly, you know, I think COVID put a real focus on the importance of, of health and family etc so so i would try and say that i think you know I'm, I'm i'm still ambitious but ultimately you know i want my family to be happy and healthy and and uh, and and live long productive lives themselves but i still have that kind of impetus or or, or desire to it, it's simplistic but to make a difference to do important work to do stuff that it, it's it's a little twee or, or simplistic to say change lives, but I've seen the power of education, right? I, did, I mentioned my dad who he passed away a few years ago, um, but he would walk the streets of Newcastle and people would come up to him and go and say, Mr. Bell, if it wasn't for you, you know, I would have been, I would have had a terrible life or I would have. And to see that as a, as a kid with your father involved, like leaves that impression. And, and, you know, my dad taught for 20, 25 years so he impacted a lot of lives. We've got tools and and or megaphones, if you like, um, particularly where I am now on the, the AWS or Amazon side of things. It, it's this art of the possible is still considered. And, and I work with partners and platforms that include things like Netflix and Prime. And we're looking at those tools and how engaging they, those are and how you know, I was actually saying, Michelle, just before the start, my wife and I ended up binge watching uh, a show last night on, on Netflix that we hadn't uh, seen before. 
But, you know, you, you look at that, that show popped up because I'd watched a few other things that suggested to the recommendation algorithm that I would like this new show. And you know what? It was right. Now, it's not infallible, but we've got that kind of tool and scale for social and entertaining. And, and I'm interested in this crossover again between entertainment and, if you like, intrinsic motivation. So we were motivated to sit through, <clears throat> this is embarrassing, but six episodes. There were seven, so we didn't, we didn't go crazy. We sat through six <laughs> episodes of, of the show, which is very good. Um, we've saved the last one for tonight. But we, we sat through that because it was motivating. We wanted to find out what was next. We wanted it. it, it, was, it, it it's kind of a mystery sort of thing. So you've got that, what's going to happen? Now, it's not a direct correlation, but there are certainly tools and systems and principles that we can use in an educational environment that bring it closer to that world. Because this is the world that we're living in where, you know, stuff is tailored to you, it's personalized, and it's how you want to access it, right? We chose to access six episodes in a row, not seven, not five. Um, but education has been sort of in this environment since, you know, I'll say 1500s, 1600s, where it's, it's typically been a lecture at Three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, take it or leave it. It's an hour long. It's an hour and a half long. That's it. Some people succeed with that. Some people don't. Um, when you look at the tools and technologies and, and as I say, the recommendation engines, the AI assistance that we've got now, can we do something that makes education more tailored, more personalized, that speaks to more people? Um, and, and I so agree with you that the the range is what's important. But yeah. just to, to reflect back on what you're saying is um, important to you for success. And I think that um, I, I really hear that, that, you know, making a difference and having mm. had that role model from your father, you, you, you mentioned, you know, that he impacted children for 20 to 25 years and having them come up and, and yeah. mention the, the um, effects and the results of that impact that he had from that passion. And I can mm. very much hear that with your tools, you know, whether it's the AI, the algorithms or whatever, mm. that you're, yeah. you're thinking they're along that same sort of line, but yeah. your, your reach is much bigger now. I, and I had that example, sorry, Michelle, but early in my career, I, I mentioned the young president of Marlborough College who went on to Southern New Hampshire as president there, still there, Paul LeBlanc. Um, and he he kind of came back and took me with him ultimately, um, and and look he 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 was the one that had realised the potential of technology before I had he he built the graduate centre at Marlborough College, but then at Southern New Hampshire he got a chance to do it at scale, um, and you know he was he's, Paul's a great guy I, I would say father figure but he'd be so insulted because he's not that much older than me but um, he he had the confidence to say we should do stuff with this we should impact lives and you know. Southern New Hampshire is a good level college, a good education, but we used to say, look, we're not, we're not Harvard. We're not trying to do things in that mode or that modality. Um, but he had the confidence to grow an institution. During my time there, we went from about 20,000 students to 80,000 students. And his mantra was, we're going to change people's lives. We're going to positively impact people's lives. We might not, I think at one point he said, you know, we don't necessarily need to shoot for developing presidents, prime ministers, et cetera, but let's get people off the shop floor. Let's get them from blue collar to white collar. Let's get them from, I'll make these figures up, but let's say a 40,000 a year job to a 70,000 a year job. And that sort of delta, and, and Southern New Hampshire is not a particularly expensive school. So, you know, can students get through with, a reasonable, manageable amount of debt in a reasonable amount of time and have a different life. Um, and he himself, as a, as a Canadian an immigrant from Canada, his family, you know, he, he became an American citizen. He was the first in his family to go to college. So he had that experience himself. And he was another one who mapped that on. So it's almost like a version of my father at scale using technologies to scale. And, and Paul took that and said, look, let's really impact lives. The 20,000 became 80,000. It's now about 200,000. So because specifically of his work, there's 180,000 more students who are getting a really pretty decent education through Southern New Hampshire and getting jobs that are two or three steps up from where they might have been. So seeing that example early in my career sort of added to my family background, my mom with technology, my dad with, you know, real passion for education and seeing the technology being used to scale in online education really, I think, set me on, on my path. So. Um, those those things combined, I think, have, have given me this uh, itch that I still haven't fully scratched. 
<laughs> <laughs> I really hear that. And again, I, I, I hear this passion coming through and, and can really sense that, you know, um, changing people's lives and, and really, you know, sh sharing tools and techniques and suggestions so that they can have a different life. So mm. with those tools and, and thinking about the mindset then behind it, what do you think for yourself or even for Paul? What were some of the things, because we, we're focused very much here in the show on what are people doing specifically to create that mindset for success? And, and if you can share a few mm. of those examples where you saw, well, because I do X, I think this shifts my mindset or focuses it strongly in this direction, or you saw it with Paul. That, that's quite great success, you know, going from 20,000 to 80,000 and then growing it to 200,000. Yeah. So what were the types of things that you were doing or Paul was doing to create that success? Yeah, I think I think it's interesting. And, and you know, we, we were talking a little bit beforehand about, you know, reflecting on yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Something that I maybe don't do well, so I admire in others, is, is, is a mix of sort of resolution my mum would sometimes say about my dad kind of pig-headedness or confidence. Um, and I remember Paul's wife at one point making a comment about Paul saying, he's always certain, comma, he's sometimes right, or he's often right, right? <laughs> and and my, I, I actually went back to the, to the college, the graduate school, where I'd done my master's and became director of Marlborough College Graduate Centre. And I inherited a lot of previous emails and correspondence from the former director and she reflected on that and said, um, Paul would, would try things and he'd try them and, and, you know, quite a few things wouldn't work. Um, and there was one email she quoted where Paul's a, a very massive basketball fan. He likes a lot of sports, but he's tall and he played basketball a lot. Um, and he, he said something about, oh, I made that decision and I've decided to roll it back because I, I realized it was having a negative impact when I saw Mark Franselin, who was a computer uh, instructor, when I saw him missing his free shots on the basketball course. So, so that degree of A, self-awareness, B, ability to acknowledge that you maybe didn't get it right with a smattering of humor to sort of be somewhat self-effacing and go, oh, you know me, I make decisions. To have that confidence and to keep going um, is something that I, I think I, I, I admire in people and I don't always have it myself. I, I, I overthink and, and get a little stressed about it. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that, that's a very human uh, condition to, you know, mm. be wondering about confidence. And, and I know that recently um, you did change careers again. Mm. And so although you had, um, if you look at it on paper, you had the technical skills, you had the background, you had the experience, you had for that. What sort of things would you say, though, that you did in beginning another career with Amazon that would, were to help you with your confidence? Because, you know, you had it and you knew it, but it's it's very natural when you're starting with a new environment and new people, there's that little bit of, oh, do I really know what I'm doing? That imposter syndrome can come up. But what yeah. did you do? I think I think some of it may be post-COVID world, maybe me maturing, I'm not sure. But I think I think what I did this time that I haven't maybe done before was 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 articulated concerns and talk to people. I, I sort of have made that note to myself sometimes, you know actually talk this through. If you're starting to feel this is maybe not quite right, don't sort of get your head down and try and work your way through it. Maybe pause and have a chat with someone. And I'm really lucky at, at, at AWS. I'm part of an industry team. So I'm higher ed and research. We've got K-12, we've got finance and fiduciary, we've got judicial. And, and the team, my boss is a guy called Don Carlson. He's pulled together a team of leaders in each field. So although our disciplines are different, um, I work with a great woman who, who, who leads the K-12. So we've got quite a lot of overlap. But, you know, local government, another section, transport, another section. It's not, it's, not a comp it, it's not a discipline where we have a lot of content overlap. But I can talk to people who make decisions, rescind decisions, have been involved in high-level discussions. And what I've found is actually, uh, I, I maybe would have predicted it going the other way. Oh, you get more confident, you get more career experience, you become more bullish. I've actually started thinking that the key is, is to be, not to be vulnerable in a, in a needy sort of way, but to be honest and say, look, I'm not quite seeing how this is going to go, or here's what I think. And, and a lot, I was really encouraged when I came on with, with AWS, because a lot of the hiring process is talking about leadership principles and tenets. 
And a lot of the pieces that I read in the onboard, and I thought, this this is right. This is how you should do it. So they've got a culture that um, is is it's prescriptive, but it, it it encourages you to challenge and it encourages you to question and encourages you to take chances and fail. We talk about two way doors. If a door's a two way door, go through it because you can come back. If it's a one way door, and once you're through it, you can't come back. Then we should have a bigger discussion. But there's a real encouragement to think about things as two way doors to set up quick teams, to make quick decisions, give it a try. And if it doesn't work, a bit like Paul LeBlanc, come back and go, hey, you know me, I gave it a try. And there's no penalty for that. I've realized that there's not necessarily a penalty for trying something in a two-way door that seems a good idea and then going, that didn't quite work. And early in my career, I think I wouldn't have done that. And I really admired, my dad just sort of didn't care. He was, he was um, as, as I said, my mom would sort of say he was uh, not, not pig-headed, but he maybe lacked a few social cues, to be honest, <laughs> reflection. He would just do stuff and say, well, I just felt like doing it. But he made good calls. Paul LeBlanc would make good calls. If it didn't work, he would come back. And I admired that because I thought, oh, God, if I, if I make a decision, I've got to defend it and back it up and support it and go, no, no, I was right. I was right. I was right. And, and I've learned, I think, particularly in this new environment, that that step back and, and the ability to say, not quite, that, that didn't work. Here's the reasons we did it. Here's the reasons it didn't work. Come back. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the benefit of the experience that I've had. And it's the it's 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 been the shift of moving to this environment that is very can do and it's very out of the possible. So I feel privileged to be in the role I'm in, but I feel I'm ready for it because, you know, I've had these career moments where I've thought, yeah, I need to maybe do this differently. And I, I hear that, that that's a wonderful, a beautiful way of sharing about the progression within yourself and within your career mm -hmm. and, and being in the right place, right time now for that, that two-way door. So mm -hmm. I, I, I love how um, there's a few things in what you said there, but one of them is obviously that um, you have a team, a support network of colleagues that are equally experts in their fields. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you've got a support base where um they might not be doing the same things as you, but they're doing similar things. And so you've got people, colleagues that you can talk to about things. Mm. But more importantly, I loved, uh, I loved hearing how you said that you were able to be vulnerable and ask questions and share that you didn't quite understand what do they mean by this or I don't know how this will work in my space. All of that vulnerability about um, asking the stupid questions that in many mm. cultures... They say ask it, but when you do, you're then culturally kind of um, feeling awkward for having asked it. But from what you're saying, it's, you know, encouraged because you're now in another environment like with Paul where you can set up teams, take action. And, and that's what I'm hearing as well. You can take the action. They trust you as an expert and as a leader to do that action. But they also trust that if you then want to go, well, that's not quite working, and you pull the plug, that mm. your vulnerability, you will talk through, this is working, this is working, but this is not quite working. What do you think? And you'll, you'll have those difficult, challenging, whatever conversations to then come to a, a higher level, you know, reasoning around yeah. what's going on to make those higher level questions. And, and you would expect... Um, you know, Amazon and large technology giants to be able to create these types of cultures so that people can keep learning, challenging, failing, growing, all of those things. And mm. I love that um, two-way door and, and the no penalty for trying. And mm. if you were to think about your process with that, what, what were maybe some of the things that you needed to possibly overcome yourself to to get that confidence to feel like, well, I can be vulnerable. You know, you've kind of dipped your toe in the water, mm -hmm. <laughs> so to speak, and the world, you know, continued on. What, what do you think that um, you would suggest to people who may not be in similar sorts of environments that they can do to mm -hmm. keep building their confidence in a similar way? I, th I think, and again, it wasn't a, a brilliant plan by me, but I've ended up, with a with a brilliant with a great network of people who I do now trust and who I, I literally you know buzzed four of my colleagues in a, in a discussion this morning and said hey sorry to ask some stupid questions but where are you at with this and where are you at with this and the answers have popped up I, I've not looked at them yet 
but I've got good people around me now and I've recognized that. I didn't maybe recognize that early in my career. And fortunately, you know, we have things like LinkedIn and social media where you can kind of take a step back and say, you know, I'm making this up, but you know, hey, hey, Bob, we work together. And I never kind of said like how much I enjoyed working with you. What are you up to now? And and that sort of loose social network almost has been really, really valuable. Um, and, you know, and I, I look back now at my career US wise and realize like, wow, these people have gone on to great places. I have three or four um, former colleagues who are, who are presidents of universities in the US or are really well placed at big institutions. And I, I think, as I said, maybe early in my career, I didn't I didn't realize that. And I needed to sort of show that I could do it and I can do it and I can do it. And you realize, particularly when you join somewhere like Amazon, that's a big, big institution almost every detail of my job someone somewhere is better at it than me I'm, I'm a good generalist i always have been you know pretty good at being general and pretty good at getting across things quickly but you know if it gets technical i need to hand off if it gets really sort of technical and into servers and networks and switches i need to hand off to someone if it gets really deep I, i've got a functional knowledge of ai machine learning artificial intelligence if it starts to get really deep and, and our customers start asking questions i need to pull in the team and I've got access to that team. So, so I'm lucky now in that I guess AWS is sort of a, a, a micro reflection of my whole life, but I didn't realize I had that in my life. And I think a lot of people don't, and they don't realize that, you know, the, 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 the colleagues that they've had and, and people that they've met along the way, I, I think that would be my encouragement. You know, just, we've got the tools now, stay in touch. It, it's never, in, in my career, it's, it's never like your best mate or your very close colleague who gets you the next position or the next contact. It's someone who knows someone who knows someone. And those sort of loose two or three links are often the most valuable and we neglect them, right? We keep in touch with our three best friends, the three people that we see. And you, you forget, you've got that network of 50 or 100 or 200 of people like, I mean, to be honest, like yourself, Michelle, we, we've not known each other a long time. We met, we had a couple of good conversations. Sorry, whether you like it or not, we're connected now, and and periodically I will hassle you and say how are things going. Um, and it might lead to nothing. It might lead to a few coffees. It might lead to your lunch, or it might be that you know when your life takes a turn or my life takes a turn, one of us could really help the other out. And it's not that we're. It, I'm, I'm not saying that you know use people or use the network. Make sure you've got people. It's it's just the serendipity of having a great group of smart people that we can stay connected with there, there are three or four that i'm happy to cut off and think yeah you know they had issues and, and god bless them but you know they're on their own um that <laughs> that sort of core group of people that as i say loose social ties just just keep tabs on people drop people notes especially as i said we've had we've had pandemic we've had terrible times and that human connectivity i think is is really valuable and we've now hopefully got through that and we've got opportunity to make more connections and 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 that would be my experience talking good things will come of those connections um which i, I, I really realized early <laughs> yeah and, and i really hear that um that reflecting that you're doing and, and mm. wonderful wonderful um explanation as well about the power of those connections and and the power i mean by um having somebody to ask questions to having somebody to um, go to and, and talk about, oh, you know, I'm looking for a job or I'm looking for an opportunity or I'm looking for this information mm. or whatever it might be or an introduction to, you know, somebody. I, re I remember when I wrote mm. my book, it was very much the power of LinkedIn that helped me to connect to this person that I knew and say, oh, can you introduce me to someone so I'd like them to be in my book and mm. things like that that um, was a very new at the time experience for me to do but you're so beautifully sharing that that similar kind of reaching out to people. And more so, I, I agree, since COVID and, and where we are now, of just keeping those networks and keeping that touch together. But we could talk about the power of networks for much longer, Kevin. My question now is, how you're so fascinating. If people wanted to get hold of you, what's the best way to connect with you? Um probably through an initial LinkedIn just because I'm I'm there. My name's fairly, fairly simple, Kevin Bell, spelled as you as you would expect. And and from some of the things I've said, you could track me down. Oh yeah, the Kevin Bell that works at Amazon or used to work at Southern New Hampshire. Um so so that would probably be the easiest way just to send me a, a connection. I, I almost always say sure. And then you know we could follow up outside of that. 
Um, Fabulous. And if you were to give some advice to your younger self, the younger self that is, you know, watching your very important mother and father, and, and what advice might it be? Mm. Um, I think two things. I think, I think you know, as humans, and we've certainly proved this over the last few years, we're, we're pretty resilient. So I think I would, I would sometimes say to my younger self, look, just chill. It's going to be all right. And, and I've had a few forks in my career. I could have gone A, I could have gone B. I do wonder what, what would B be like? If I did. But my sense is they probably both would have been okay. So I think, I think it'd be twofold. It would just say, look, relax. Things are going to be okay. Just keep doing what you're doing. And then I think it's the don't overthink, right? I, I think we can get that paralysis. And, you know, I mean, I, I've referenced COVID as a, as a positive impetus. Let's get stuff. But it, 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 it undermined a lot. It made people really sort of nervous about the future worrying about what's going to happen what if my i mean not that bad things can't happen irrespective but i think generally sort of getting in an environment with people that you talk to with people and good colleagues as we've mentioned and and keeping going back in your judgment giving yourself a go don't overthink people will generally be forgiving and people answer dumb questions right i, I ask 10 of them a day and my colleagues are great and they go you know what? Yeah, I kind of wondered about that myself, but I didn't like to ask it because I thought it was a dumb question. So you, you're helping people out by being stupid sometimes, which I'm great at. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been an incredible conversation and I love that, um, you know, that reassurance to your younger self that things will be okay and, and don't mm. have some wonderful, wonderful advice for um, not just your younger self, but for any time. But for now, Kevin... Thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. Not at all. Very nice to meet you, Michelle, and, and keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. So thank you as well to the audience, and thank you for watching yet another incredible episode where we've heard from yet another expert about some really, really insightful tools and, and approaches to building that mindset for success. But for now, from my heart to your heart, be great, be fabulous, and be you. Thank you.